Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit about where we are with the grass-fed sector today, and then we're going to dive into questions, because I know you have a lot of questions, so I'm not going to go through a bunch of slides and all of that. Uh, many of you have heard me speak multiple times, so no need to, to continue to reiterate on things that you, you've probably already seen, and I know many of you have a lot of questions that you would like to get out in front of everybody. So basically, um, th this is our facility from Joyce Farms in North Carolina. That's a poultry processing facility. Um, this is the, your potential. Many of you have seen this, but you can produce a high percentage choice and prime grass-fed beef, okay? So it can be done. Whether that's your market desire or not, that's up to you, all right? Solely up to you. But the fact of the matter is, is that it cannot be debated any longer that you can produce high percentage choice and prime grass-fed beef. We absolutely know that. And we can do that, frankly, at a higher percentage than the average of the feedlot industry can do it, all right? So, that part is, is sort of given. This is just some carcass data to illustrate that, pulled off at random points. Uh, you can very easily see you know, the performance in those cattle, the percent that graded choice, percent that graded prime, and the percent that graded select on these individual loads that are represented here. Now, let's dive into what's happening. You know, the industry has grown quite a bit. And make no mistake about it, this has been very much a consumer-driven market. Not a retailer-driven, not a distributor-driven, not a restaurant-driven, okay? But it has been a consumer-driven market. Why? Because the consumer is telling us very clearly, not just in grass-fed beef, but other pasture proteins and other high-attribute food products, that this is what they desire. They want food products that they deem have higher attributes in many different facets, and we'll talk about what some of those are. Many of you have seen this, but to just put it into perspective for those of you that have not, in 1998, this was very much a fledgling industry. You can see the numbers up there. We had less than $5 million in retail value in domestically produced grass-fed beef at that point in time. Not a lot of producers that were doing this in a serious manner. But by 2016, we had several thousand producers who were producing grass-fed beef in a serious fashion with over $3 billion worth of retail value, okay? Or, excuse me, over $4 billion by 2016. However, here's what I want to point out, and this is one of the things I want to discuss today because it's highly relevant to our sector and our continued growth domestically. Look at the distribution of that $4 billion, okay? 560 million of it was from domestically produced product and the balance from imported product. Where's the imported product coming from? It's coming from Australia, New Zealand, South America, okay? Now, nothing against the imported product whatsoever, but we're going to talk about the issue in a little bit, okay? I believe people ought to have a choice. If they want Australian or New Zealand or South American grass-fed beef, perfectly fine, but they need to understand where it is derived from so that they make an informed decision. It's been growing over the last 15 years at a rate of 20 to 25 percent annually. Now compared to the commercial beef sector, does anybody have an idea how that compares? What's been the growth rate over the exact same time period for the commercial beef sector? Okay, for a large portion of that time period it was actually negative, wasn't it? There was no growth. There was a decrease in production and consumption. Okay. So my point in that is saying that rather than thinking that the grass-fed sector, and, and, and I'm saying this because this has been a real factor. We've had a lot of people in the commercial grain sector or the commercial beef sector 
that are finishing on grain and all of that that really hate grass-fed beef and grass-fed beef producers. And I think we know that if we're a grass-fed beef producer. And I have been in meetings like this and had those guys confront me. You know, well, you guys are damning grass-fed or grain-fed beef, and you're taking away from our market, and you're confusing the consumer, and all of those types of things. But the fact of the matter is, is grass-fed beef has been one of the bright, shining stars in the beef industry over the last two decades. And it has allowed us to actually grow total beef market share rather than that beef market share continuing to diminish. Okay? And another fact is that the, the vast majority of the consumers that are purchasing grass-fed beef were not purchasing grain-fed beef. So we have attracted consumers that prior to this were not purchasing beef. And here's another thing, folks, and I want you to understand this clearly. In agriculture, this is our biggest problem, and it's not just in beef, but it's in all agricultural products. We have had it drilled into our heads that we cannot market our products and that we cannot differentiate and distinguish our products. How many of you have been involved in marketing and sales in here? Okay, a lot of you. Well, folks, how do you sell anything at all if you cannot distinguish and differentiate your product? You can't. Every one of you in here today is wearing a different brand of clothing or shoes, right? So you selected specific, you aren't wearing generic clothing, are you? You're not driving a generic vehicle. Your tractors aren't generic. All of your haying equipment, even your squeeze chutes, even your trailers are not generic. You choose a specific make, brand, and model because you deem, for whatever reason, that's the better choice, right? Every consumer is like that. And yet we want to think in agriculture that we cannot distinguish and differentiate in our food products that we just got to give the consumer a generic product or else we're confusing them. But yet on everything else they buy, that doesn't confuse them. Folks, we're not making any sense, okay? We got to get a lot smarter about our marketing and what we do. That is what is going to carry us into the future. That's what's going to allow us to be highly profitable, productive, efficient, and sustainable. So that is what we have to wrap around our minds. All right? So let's put into perspective what's happening domestically. So from July 2015 to July of 16, we had about 232,000 head that were harvested domestically in the U.S. of grass fats. Now, to put that into perspective of the total beef market in the U.S., over that same time period, how many total fat cattle were harvested? Anybody know? Hugh, you got a guess on that? I'd be wrong. Be wrong? <laughs> okay, right around 29 million head, right? right around 29 million heads. So this is very much what? A drop in the bucket, right? A drop in the bucket. Out of that 232,000 head, about 189,000 of them were harvested by branded programs. The top 15 branded programs harvested about 129,000. That left about 43,000 head that were harvested by all of you out here that direct market, okay? And in totality, we produced about 100.1 million pounds of domestic grass-fed beef product. So, what are some of the present developments? Well, JBS has jumped into the domestic market by purchasing grass-run farms. And many of you are aware of that. That happened quite a while ago. But... They've always been in the grass-fed beef market, though, haven't they? Okay, this is nothing new for them, all right? They've always been in. 
but this, that was their domestic purchase. They also now have introduced an organic grass-fed beef program, but all of that product is imported from Australia. Grass-fed beef is now offered in all Carl's Jr.'s and Hardy's restaurants in North America. Where does that come from? Australia, okay. Outback Restaurant now offers 100% grass-fed beef hamburger. Where does that come from? Australia, okay. Cargill is integrally involved, yes. Well, it's coming in under a USDA grass-fed label, okay? It, maybe, maybe not. It's coming in under a USDA grass-fed label, okay? And that is the real answer. Uh, other than that, we don't really know, to be honest with you. How about the imported? Oh, that's what I'm talking about, the imported product. It's coming in under a... USDA grass-fed label, right. Everything that was contributed to that and the production of that animal, we don't really know, okay? And that's, I'm not saying anything one way or the other because I don't know what to say one way or the other. We just truly don't know. But it is coming in under a USDA grass-fed label. Now, Bill Helming and Rabobank, Don Close and Rabobank, both projected that grass-fed beef is supposed to or, or they project that it'll increase to about 30% or more of the total beef market share in the U.S. within the next five to eight years. Okay. Here's how we segmented. We still have the commodity grain fed. We'll still have that. That's not going to disappear. But it is shrinking and it will continue to shrink. Okay. We have the all-natural grain fed market. That's actually continuing to grow the organic grain fed and the organic grass fed. Then we have the grass fed itself, but that is segregated very definitively into a lean grass fed market and a high quality grass fed market. So that's clearly what we're seeing. And interest is growing very rapidly in a non-GMO, both non-GMO on the grass fed and a non-GMO grain fed. And that is continuing to grow and will continue to grow. And as a matter of fact, if we are smart and we want to continue to grow the beef market share, we better jump all over that because the consumer is telling us very plainly that is what they want. Now, what that means, though, is that we're going to have a very difficult time growing that in the near term, aren't we? And why? Why? Why can we not grow that rapidly? Availability of non-GMO grains, right? Just sheer availability of non-GMO grains at any kind of reasonable price point. Okay, so that, that's a detractor. All right, I'm going to skip over all of this. All right, this is what I wanted to get to, and then we'll jump to questions. Okay, we have challenges. No sector is without it. When I first started in this deal in the 90s, you could sell grass-fed beef just because. All right? You didn't have to distinguish, differentiate, didn't matter the quality of the product. You could sell it just because. And that stayed that way for about 10 years. You know, nobody graded the product. Nobody differentiated between it was all thrown into the same cases and everything else. You could have anywhere from a, a standard strip loin primal to a high choice strip loin primal all in the same box going to the same customer. Okay? And they still bought it. All right, they still bought it. But then, folks, we started to get a little bit of a saturation and all of the influx of the imported because, you know, everybody saw the opportunity and so the imports started flooding in and all of that changed. And it changed pretty rapidly. And now, customers want to know a whole lot more about the end product quality and so forth of that grass-fed beef that they're buying. And they'll no longer readily accept 
tremendous variation and in, in inconsistency in the product. They want it as uniform and consistent as they can possibly get it. So here are some of our big challenges. The first challenge is we do have to continue to become more consistent and uniform in the product that we produce. No more excuses. We don't need to make excuses anymore. We have the ability, we have the knowledge, folks, to be able to be consistent and uniform. So let's get about the business of doing that and quit making excuses for not doing that. Secondly, another challenge is the feedlot style grass-fed beef. Okay? So we have to understand, you know, that yes, this is happening. You know? So again, what about it? Here's my stand. If the consumer truly understands what they're purchasing, good. Let them make their choice. Just like they can make their choice with grain-fed, all-natural, organic, whatever, right? I've, or even imported, as long as they know, as long as they know, okay? So I'm fully in favor of any type of beef being put on the market as long as it is clearly and properly labeled and marketed according to the method of production, and that there's no deception to the consumer whatsoever. And then the consumer makes an informed decision, and that's good. We're all good, okay? So the second is imported grass-fed. Here's the deal about it. Again, I just said I'm fine with the consumer buying imported as long as they are aware of that. But here's our problem, and hence our challenge in the domestic grass-fed sector here. When was cool legislation for beef and pork repealed? Does anybody know? Okay. Two years ago, December, right? All right. So that means that there is no longer any country of origin labeling requirement for beef marketed in the U.S. Now, because of that, what happens with all the imported beef that comes into the U.S.? Okay, first of all, it goes through a USDA processing plant, right? Okay, and once it does that, what can be put on the retail label? Product of USA. Now, here's what the consumer at the grocery store looks for if they're looking for grass-fed beef. They first look for a label that says grass-fed beef, right? Okay. Then they look down and they see a little bug that says USDA inspected and passed, right? Then they see product of USA written on there. Automatically, what does that consumer think? But it's not, okay? But it's not. That's a major problem. That's a major problem. And that's something we have to address. We also have a lack of a strong pasture protein trade association, and we need to create national brand awareness with certifications that consumers trust. So I'm, I'm welcome. I introduced those challenges. Those are some of the things that we're facing right now, and I welcome questions for all of us to discuss these things. Yes, Ron.